morning, I'm Adam Sexton. Just two years and a few months in Congress, and it seems like every time you turn around, Representative Chris Pappas is casting a vote on something that is not just newsworthy, but massive, like the COVID relief bills or momentous like a pair of impeachments. And there's more to come with a lot on President Biden's list. Here this morning to discuss is Congressman Chris Pappas himself. Thank you for joining us, sir. Good morning, Adam. Good to see you. Uh, the president's address to Congress and the nation this last week, we learned a lot more about his $1.8 trillion families plan, pay leave, child care, universal pre-K. Are you already a yes vote on this proposal or are you starting to have any concerns right now about the growing amount of future taxpayer dollars being spent here? Well, you don't commit to anything until you see the details, until you get down into the legislation. And I think what we have seen over the last year has been a largely bipartisan effort to make sure that our country can weather this storm. Um, we had a, a rescue plan that was signed into law by the president about a month and a half ago now that is just beginning to deliver important results to the people of New Hampshire. 600,000 direct impact payments, more support to our small businesses, direct help for our cities and towns, uh, as well as help for people to stay on their health insurance. So there was a lot of valuable help there. And we've got to understand as we move forward, what are the long-term impacts of the economic catastrophe that we just experienced and the health crisis. What are American families going to need uh, to be able to make it in this economy and to get ahead and stay ahead? So I think we have to explore the various facets of the American Families Plan as it was presented to Congress. Um, right now, we're actually knee deep in infrastructure, talking about the jobs proposal that the president has outlined. I'm a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, so we're looking closely at how we modernize our transportation infrastructure, do it in a sustainable way. But what I have to say is that um, COVID was an emergency response. Um, we needed to push funding out as quickly as possible. And we could look at those as one-time expenses to get our country back up and running to save people's lives. Um, as we talk about programs like family leave or infrastructure or health care, we have to come up with sustainable ways of paying for these if we're going to pass them. Uh, we just can't be putting things on the nation's credit card as we move forward. And we've got to put ourselves in the position to be able to grapple with uh, the debt and deficit issue. So these absolutely have to be financed. So we're talking both about expenditures and revenues. And let's put everything out on the table and see what uh, the American people will truly need and if we can come up with, with a way of financing it. And Congressman, the For the People Act would make some pretty significant changes to the way elections are conducted in New Hampshire. Why favor a sort of national one-size-fits-all approach versus the way the Granite State currently is doing its elections? Well, I have nothing but a high regard for our local election officials and what they do, particularly what they pulled off over the course of the last year. And I think it's really important that we understand that uh, there is a responsibility for our federal government and for Congress to play when it comes to uh, you know, conducting our elections and making sure that they are fair and free, uh, supporting uh, democracy in our country. Uh, it is in the Constitution, and I think H.R. 1 owns up to the responsibility we have to ensure that our government at all levels is uh, governed by we the people. Um, so the For the People Act has provisions that would make it easier and not harder to vote. We've seen an effort across the country, unfortunately, since the last election, fueled by these conspiracy theories about the outcome of the election, uh, where legislatures have sought to put up additional barriers for people to access the right to vote. And I think that's something we need to take a look at. We should be looking for ways to ensure that people don't need an excuse to vote by absentee ballot. Um, that um, it's easy for people to register and cast their ballots. Uh, and the For the People Act also takes on the issue of corruption in our political system and takes on big money. I don't know anyone who thinks that uh, the way that, uh, you know, campaign finance law operates in this country, particularly in the wake of the Citizens United decision, is fair or creates a level playing field for everyday Americans. And so uh, we've got to address that as well. That's another uh, provision in the bill. So I hope as things move forward, we can you know, find some bipartisan consensus on some of these provisions. I think it's really urgent to make sure that we shore up our democracy. So ultimately, our federal officials and elected officials at all levels are translating the will of the people um, and uh, you know, not just seeing more of the same in terms of our political system, which unfortunately, 
hasn't allowed us to address the key issues that are most important to people across this country. Since we last spoke in January, there's been quite the COVID-19 vaccine blitz and New Hampshire appears to be doing very well on that front. But if the state plateaus at about 70% vaccination and that's where it's going to stay, what are you going to do? When do you think you're going to unmask and get back to more normal events? Uh, is that going to be sometime this year or do you think you're going to continue taking these precautions for the foreseeable future? Well, I think we all need to heed the guidance and CDC came out with some important guidance last week about being outdoors and being among folks who are vaccinated and, uh, you know, relaxing masking requirements in those settings. And I think that's an important step forward. We need to hit that benchmark. And so it's critically important that uh, everyone in New Hampshire signs up to get their appointment. Uh, there are appointments available and they are available uh, very close to where you live. I just got my second shot last week. It all went well. And as we see the vaccine get into more of a community setting and away from these bigger sites over time, uh, we've got to make sure that everyone has access, uh, especially younger people who are now eligible for the vaccines. Um, that's going to be really important to make sure that uh, kids who are experiencing some impacts from this, uh, some are getting sick and dealing with long lasting impacts are safe moving forward. So uh, I think we've got to continue to listen to the public health experts. This can't be a political issue. The support that we've provided through the rescue plan has been really instrumental in making sure that New Hampshire can ramp up these efforts. We want to make sure that they succeed. Uh, New Hampshire is sort of at the, the top of the pile in terms of states uh, with a number of people uh, getting their first shot. I hope we can continue to lead the way and, and really just be grounded in science and, and good public health. Congressman, to what extent should the federal government uh, subsidize or provide the vaccine to overseas countries that might have trouble getting it otherwise? Well, we have a, a vested interest in making sure that the virus doesn't come back here in different forms. What we're seeing in India right now is particularly alarming where their healthcare system has totally been overrun by COVID. Um, there apparently are new strains there. And we know that the more infections are happening around the world, the more likely this virus is to mutate and perhaps to be able to overcome the immunity that we are now building up through a vaccination program here in the United States. So we do have a vested interest to make sure that we are sharing this advancement with the rest of the world. I think opening up the AstraZeneca vaccine, we have a supply of that to other countries is sensible. Um, and we should be working with uh, the World Health Organization and um, other uh, national organ international organizations to make sure the United States is playing its role. Um, clearly, we need to hit the numbers we need to hit here in the United States. But even then, we are not out of the woods, and we've got to be working with countries from around the world to make sure we get a lid on the uh, emerging situation that's pretty scary in some other nations. Back to the political world, you recently returned a donation uh, from the PAC of your colleague, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Why don't you want her money? Are your politics really that different from hers that her cash is tainted in your eyes? Well, look, I'm a New Hampshire Democrat first and foremost, and I always run my campaigns that way. And to be honest, uh, information about uh, you know how to make a contribution to our campaign was was given out. We didn't request the money, and so we just thought it was easiest just to give it back. Um, our campaigns are always going to be run, you know, based on the grassroots support we have here in New Hampshire. Ultimately, that's who I'm accountable to, and I think we um, you know look forward to. Uh, any future contests, uh, we will be ready. Um, we have won two tough races here in New Hampshire in a Republican leading district. Um, and I think right now we're focused on how we can deliver results, how we make sure that we are there for the people of New Hampshire through this tough time. Uh, and I hope people can judge me on the merits of my work uh, in the next election. You just voted yes for statehood for Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and Guam. Could be right behind them. Uh, you do D.C., there's not much of an argument really uh, against uh, those other territories joining in. How do you respond to a constituent who says this is just too much change too quickly? Well, I think this is an issue that has been out there for a long time, and there has been longstanding bipartisan support uh, in Congress for making D.C. a state. Um, we don't appear to be getting that kind of bipartisan support these days, but it's really an issue of justice. Uh, D.C. has petitioned the federal government to become a state. Um, I think this is an issue where you have 700,000 people that don't have representation. Um, but yet uh, are subject to federal taxes and, and all sorts of rules and regulations. We saw, frankly, on January 6th, 
um, the deficiencies that exist in D.C., not uh, being a state itself having to rely on uh, support from its neighbors and not being able to make the call on whether or not to send out the National Guard. Um, so there are issues that have come up, and I think it's an issue of uh, democracy, of racial justice, um, and I think it's long past the time to address it. Um, if there are other cases where um, you know, um, territories are, are seeking statehood, we can evaluate those. But I think this is a movement that has gained strength over a number of decades. And we're the only country in the world whose national capital doesn't have representation uh, in our Congress. And I think it's time to address that. So just to clarify there, you think, see things differently with Puerto Rico and Guam. You're not automatically a yes for them to join. I, I haven't looked at those cases, to be honest, but I think D.C. has very clearly petitioned the federal government and ask for this. Um, and I think it, it's an issue of justice and democracy that can't be ignored. All right, Congressman Chris Pappas, thank you for joining us on Close Up. Thanks, Adam. Take care.